Good morning. Today is Monday, July 13th. It's 10 a.m. and we will begin the special meeting uh, to discuss township policies and practices concerning requirements for emergency access provisions in residential subdivisions located within Beaver Creek Township. Uh, thank you, Board. Um, this is an issue that uh, staff has been working on, and uh, we have really two issues we need to discuss. One more of an immediate issue, and two an overall policy uh, in regards to what direction we would, would like to go with emergency access to the subdivisions within the, uh, within the community, um, and allow emergency access, secondary accesses as well. Um, before you today, and in a hard copy in front of you, is a list of all the known uh, emergency accesses within the jurisdiction. Um, and they're labeled there. Um, I'll let uh, Mr. Amrain take over the meeting at this point to discuss the history and uh, the immediate needs. We do have a map of the, uh, the plat that we'll be talking about in regards to the immediate needs so that we can provide direction on the 16th uh, Green County Regional Planning in what direction the township would like to go. Right, that would One more thing, I'm sorry. And Mr. Uh, Ken LeBlanc is here from Green County Regional Planning. Uh, he can also offer some insight of what other communities are doing as well in regards to emergency access. Sorry, Ed. Thank as you. well as some history, uh, some local history as well. Um, <clears throat> this is, the, the reason for requesting this special meeting now is that we have another section of uh, Bexley River West um, coming up for review at the county level. And before we go into those meetings, on, uh, which begin with a staff review meeting on the 16th, which is Thursday, right? Um, we wanted to make sure that representatives of the township enter that meeting with um, a unified point of view as to both what we're going to require of the developer of Bexley uh, for the new section and uh, and then we realized as we got deeper into those discussions with each other that we really need a policy statement and so we started looking bigger picture. Um, so th those are the two points that uh, Mr. Zaharia was referring to. In front of you, you have uh, a history of what's happened with regard to emergency access, this timeline here. Um, and to put it in its simplest forms right now, there is none. Although it was present on site plans that were approved by both the um, Zoning Commission and the Trustees um, for a number of different reasons. The emergency access points either never were installed or uh, once installed became compromised and unuseful. So we're wondering now, okay, how what kind of a stance do we want to take with regard to emergency access points, a secondary access point in this subject, in this new section, as, as the developer prepares to put in a new section for section um, 3B? Um, uh, Chief has drawn the two uh, access points that were discussed earlier that now either has a house on it or uh, is obstructed either through DPNL's infrastructure being in place. Um, the house where the easement is, the overhang uh, from the house is actually into the easement. The foundation is within the restriction, but the, the overhang of the actual structure is in the easement. And quite frankly, there's no way we'd be able to get a fire engine through that easement or the secondary easement that was approved later on, which is the DPNL or the DPNL uh, infrastructure is. Right. So the, the initial easement route was obstructed. A second, uh, a second one was agreed to, and as far as the record indicates, 
that second go round at establishing an emergency access easement to the subdivision is still in effect um, legally. Um, so um, we've talked about how to be helpful to the developer, suggesting alternatives. Um, we haven't yet had those conversations with him, um, but we have sent an initial message to him that it's going to be an issue. We, we will be discussing it when it gets to the county level, but we want to make sure that we, first of all, as I said, that we're all saying the same thing, we, all of us from the township, and that we have um, support from the trustees, both in, in terms of how to approach this approval process and in terms of policy. So uh, you could go at it from either direction. I, I, it, I have a couple of questions. How that matches the map we have, the map up in front. The blue lines. Um, are roadways that now exist. It's the blue lines represent section 3A of Bexley. Is that Danbury Place, Trafalgar Place, is that what you have out yes. right there too? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, so okay. this cool. is and we call the sack in the back. Yeah, this is right. Danbury. This is Trafalgar. Um, I can't remember what's this one called again? Bucky they don't have a name on the map here, so okay. I don't know what it is. Going into the cone. Okay, I just. And then this is Mount Zion Church, is what yeah. And those are actually streets. <coughs> Correct. Everything that's. Okay. Hyde Park Place is the name of the one with the cul de sac. So, where, is, where was the emergency access supposed to come in through that red line there and then come in between those two houses? The original was this lower red line and it hooked up in uh, along the, uh, the lot lines here. Um, and that was the one that was obstructed by DPNL. And then they reconfigured it so that it turned and then came up on the other side of that same corner lot. And this is the one that was obstructed by the overhang and now by a fence and a tree of this house. Okay. But, uh, <coughs> Chief, is the purpose of this meeting for us to decide how the best to design this entrance, or is it is, are we determining a for, formal policy that we're going to, and then delegate that to? Staff believes that one, that they're, that they're, um, interwoven, that, the, that, the, okay. that one proceeds from the other, and, and um, if, if we make a decision here in this meeting, for example, about how to approach the county approval process with regard to this subdivision, it has implications for what our policies are, and we might as well articulate those now so that we can be consistent moving forward. We, we don't want to be accused by one developer of having favored another by not requiring. It will also so. indicate any our uh, stance on any emergency access being put uh, considered and also the maintenance thereof. And that's correct. One, so. And that's not all, that would be wherever the fire apparatus has to be able to access. Right, and the larger and, and the larger issue is one inspections of it, and two who maintains them. You know, some of them are concrete. Um, some of them are bike paths that are uh, reinforced in regard to allow emergency equipment to go on. Others are ground reinforced with grass on top. Um, and the question is not only for the township, but would be a question later on, depending on the direction we go here, is a question in the city. Um, who is responsible for maintaining those? Uh, some have homeowners associations, most do not, um, that are in existence in, in some of the city neighborhoods. So, um, so it's, we have an immediate need in regards to getting some direction for this neighborhood, but then the overall is um, what direction we go on with the rest of the community and how we enforce it. Um, obviously, some of the discussions with reviewing um, the Ohio Fire Code and then as well as the Southwest Ohio uh, Code that was adopted not only by the City of Beaver Creek and <coughs> Township Trustees, um, it looks like the inspections of it was going to be the responsibility of the Fire Department. Um, now, the maintenance of it, 
ask the larger and unknown question of who's going to be responsible for maintaining But what's not a, in question is that we have the authority to require the secondary okay. access points. Um, so a couple of questions, and I guess number one is on the, the, the access point that is obstructed by DPNL, either underground or overground. Over, is it underground or is it? It's a pedestal. Oh, okay. So um, how were they not in the loop that there was an emergency access right there? Is there a disconnect between the township, the county, and the utilities, or was it? I don't know. How did they not know that? It was before my time. Um, I don't know whether they were working with nice. complete. I, I, once again, I, I don't know. It showed up, and that's when. And maybe it was in before it was. You know, yeah, and I think with the DPNL, at least the history that I know of, um, and of course, once it was before my time as well, is that the box. The DPNL pedestal, once it was put in, and once it was brought into the attention, that's when the second one was put in place. Um, Does DPNL have a seat at the table for regional planning? No. It might, I'm not, not for me. There's a member that works for DPNL, but they're not. But forming. there's no representative there, and it may right. in the future behoove. Secondary utilities <coughs> aren't right to the But they, at the subdivision review meetings, they are already for They are part of Yeah. And can I ask a question on that issue then? Was, remind me, do we set those up as an easement? Is this, this was a question I think we have. Is it actually an easement? And maybe if the easement wasn't actually recorded, DPNL wouldn't necessarily be on notice of it, right? No, it's recorded. It was in the was flat and marked an emergency okay. access. Well, it was marked an emergency access and a utility easement. I think that's so where both. the problem started. Okay. Okay. And then the, I don't think there was any clear cut who supersedes who uh, on that. And so we're trying a new class that are coming in until I think this is a baby yard Separate. meeting right here. <laughs> we're going to set something that hopefully we'll all sure. work with and can. And, and what I have heard <coughs> is that when concerns were raised about the pedestal having popped up, um, the developer was unwilling to um, force, let's say, DPNL to relocate its pedestal and then that that led to the necessity for a second access okay. um, second question on this um, aerial view the center section here what's the plan for that no there's that's oh, common that's, open that's space. green space okay so is there anything precluding us from extending our emergency access down in between these two lots coming right up here and then we could actually um, access everything the ownership of the property that would require um, that the emergency access to wiggle across the property line into the property of the church and then back across to take it. That's a power line easement. You see that slanted okay. line. Okay. Um, and I, coming here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I, I don't know whether there would be a problem with that. I think not. <coughs> I'm ask because I don't think you would know better than most probably this lot. Is not developed yet, correct? The one immediate, yes, that is correct. So that lot's open. Yeah. Right. And it would get, would get the access. First one. Right. Just throwing it out. And that's one of the options we've discussed yeah, by way of sold. encouraging oh, it is the developers to sold. come up They're, with an alternative. Because we're digging on the next one down there. Actually, actually the next the, one down. Access is actually digging, digging, digging now up along the, I think it's the one right there. Yeah. There is a 10 foot easement right What's here that street? under yeah. the power lines that I could use. Bexley Hill. Oh, no, that's uh, Danbury. 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 Actually, the, the easement that comes through here now, there were a couple of lots when this was first discovered, but they, I think it was Ryan Holmes, got permits for those and closed them up really quickly. Yeah. So we weren't able to do that up there. All, all but one were already <coughs> closed off yeah. when Ryan got a hold of the, um, the vacant parcels. And then that last one you see directly above the number 28 was built this last year. Uh, yeah, this, two, is, there, this was the last yeah, one that built one's here. Right here. So there's a house there now. Too. Yes. Okay. The emergency access has to come off Shepherd. Is that no. the goal? It yeah. does not have to come off Shepherd. That's just Is there any point coming off Bexley Hills? Other than coming off Bexley, the, the single point of failure that requires the, the secondary access is this stretch right here. Which is? So uh, this is Bexley. So it would have to be on on this side of this stretch for it to, to be, well actually from, it can't be from here to here. 
because that's everything relies on that section of, of pavement. So right. we would need something off of potentially Shepherd, potentially a shared venture with Mount Zion, a connection into Windermere, or there is uh, just south of here is um, Upper Bellbrook, which would be another access point in. But it, it cannot rely on this section right. of Bexley right here. Which the developer does own the land to both the east and the south, as yeah. well as the north and Windermere. He owns all of this, to my knowledge. Yeah. Uh, this corner, I don't think he owns. It's a it's it's, farm. It is. It's a different. It's a different name. Yeah. It's a, but it's yeah. It's a different company. <laughs> so you know, if we do, if we're saying uh, interconnectivity in this, it's eventually. I don't know if he has, uh, the developer has plans to connect to Windermere. I mean, it's stubbed, obviously, to the north there. Um, but that would require, um, if we went emergency access to that point, uh, that would require going over a creek uh, and would obviously cost a little more money to make sure it's, uh, it can hold emergency equipment. The second option is ask the developer to work with Mount Zion to come in off the easement that's already exists on the south side of the parcel um, that sh shows the power line easement. Um, but that's working with the developer and working with another landowner to, to secure that. The third option is say, well, eventually these two plats are going to connect or we require that eventually these two plats connect. But in the meantime, um, what do we tell the residents and who has the authority, you know, who has to make the notification to the residents that were reported on the deed that, you know, it's only one access point. Um, the code clearly exactly allows... the worst one. I mean, I'd be really concerned. Yeah. We have one that's much, much worse than that. But the code does require that we can enforce it and require them. Um, so if we... We make a kind of a modification here that kind of goes forward with all the future developments as well. Um, the fire department's position is we would they would still like to see two points of access uh, uh, into the development. Um, one emergency access and then of course, um, like you see on the map there, the one entry point for the residential neighborhood off the Shepherd. But it shouldn't be reliant on waiting until phase five of the project to get there. I, I, I agree. And, that, and that's the difficult part with this project is that there's been a few errors in regards to the emergency access. Um, and then it puts us in a position to do we enforce it? Um, and what are our legal obligations at that point of enforcing something that's been in place for quite some time? Um, or do we work with the developer? On the, at the July 16th meeting and say we need emergency access to the, the last section. Or not the last section, well, this the next section. This yeah. new set, this? Yes. And do you have plans where that's possible? Have you indicated the plans where it would be possible to come off? I personally think there needs to be two accesses minimum to every flat, and all flats should be interconnected. I mean, I've, that's been my stance. And that's what thirty years. Um, that's so. an official stance taken by the American Planning Association, and most professional planners will tell you that uh, the correct way to go about these discussions is to begin to discourage the proliferation of cul-de-sacs yeah. in favor of connectivity. Now I know that's a fiery topic among developers and, and some <coughs> residents. People love them or hate them. Planners hate them, <laughs> um, but we've—you know—it hasn't been that long ago that this fire department had a, a, a fire that couldn't be controlled as in an ideal situation because the fire department did not have access across a designated emergency access point. So, <laughs> that would, and, I think that's a bike, little tiny bike path up into it. Well, but that uh, was designed. It was. It was designed yeah. to be emergency It wasn't access, designed so. for rebellion. That well, and that's, that's the and larger that's picture. That's why we're here. Yeah. That's part of the point. Yeah. The fences encroach, and it doesn't get plowed, and the house burned down. I mean, um, I may chip in a little bit, Ed. 
Carol, you were the chairman of the planning commission, and I was a city planner there in Beaver Creek. But we did, I think, was about the first one of these at Spring Hill into the Beaver View development in the back. When we wanted I don't know to if connect, that's the first one. Well, we wanted to connect the streets. Yes. And we had, you know, it was a big contentious meeting, and we came up with the access, and at that time it was a gate and a lock. I went there this morning on the way to work. There's a sidewalk, and I think there's enough, and there's supposed to be enough uh, construction on the bottom that would support the uh, fire truck across the two of the meeting. Um, we're running into that. Yeah, the trend now is to have these little secluded communities. Sugar Creek Township had a flat that would logically have a street come in and loop around and come back out to Little Sugar Creek Road. The, the plan then was to cut off the second access and then put a fire access in so everybody could be on a giant cul-de-sac and theoretically no cars would come through and kill their kids and run them over when they're playing basketball or whatever. So, um, this is something I think needs to be addressed and, and we need to set a tone. We're going to be working on the subdivision regulations later this year for the county and we'd like, you know, it's possible to put a section in there about dual access and fire emergency and we can put some standards in there so um, it's really time to kind of figure all this out you know, with, this, with this plat. The chief has drawn there on the, on the yellow some possibilities for the phases, uh, the, the phase mm -hmm. that's in discussion now. The options are different. Your yellow line on the south side of the I assume it's the south side, mm -hmm. is the Mount, adjacent to Mount Zion. Right. And have the access going all the way through that tree. It's almost like a whole road there. It's a we'll major road. road. They would essentially have to build a road and then decide whether they're going to maintain it as a paved or a grass surface. And how is it getting into that's the easement, foul, then? That's the easement that Mr. Kretz is pointing to. It's a, there's a 10-foot utility easement uh, overhead lines. That we can okay, it doesn't look like it comes through here. That's that line from the Shepherd. Right. Okay, but this is just a lot line. This is not. So they'd have to have a. You'd have to create an easement. Create an easement between two lots there. One looks like it's bad enough to do that. Well, there uh, should be an easement yeah, already. I'm fairly certain there's an easement the directly below. Okay, well, it is yeah. 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 There's we're going to get into the dual. Right. Now, Sugar Creek has you know, had agreements with Sugar Creek Fire is working with uh, DPNL on one of their substation sites near a flat down there. Um, and then they have a little easement through the flat in from the street. So it's possible they have worked with uh, townships before on that. Well, as much as anything, it looks to me like what you're suggesting there is that a, there should be a street rather than an easement. That should be another street coming in off of Shepherd. The original design should have been that way. Yeah. Which makes much more sense. That's, um, a, that's a shoulda, woulda, coulda. Rather than, that's an extremely long easement of which you're going to have to maintain. And no one will know it's there, it's underground, but it, it's not going to be showing. Unless it's a bike way that shows something that you can get in and out. Otherwise, it's going to be grassed over, and I know the one that you're talking about on Green Mountain Lake. Or follow. Um, yeah, I mean, the, so, there's a potential to use the first part of the red, that's uh, the original easement, and then come across onto the, if, if the landowner and the church uh, allows it, uh, and then come and then the rest of the yellow. If realistic, or Assuming that he's going to develop this into another cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, this one is that the right here, I believe, is slated to come back out to Shepherd. Yeah, that would come to Shepherd. Yeah. Then wouldn't that create a secondary? No, no because we still have, still, have still, have single, still, have, still have that single point there. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's also all within. It doesn't fit over here. Yeah, what would have made sense in the originals to take where the 28 is on the on the map there and connect that to the other road that's going to be coming off right. Shepherd eventually, but like LeBlanc said, that horse is gone. Yeah, it's gone. Go to what it should have. So I, I think the best option here is actually 
ask the developer to work with the church uh, to, and then DPNL to use the uh, south side there and give us access to the 10 foot easement. Make it a street and have houses come. Also, it's not an emergency; if it's an action. Well, eventually, we could tie it into the street, but there's still that there's going to be that yellow section with the, the current. Smaller yellow. Yeah, the smaller yellow, but the red uh, could potentially be a road coming off Shepherd. But we're still going to have to require that yellow section because if we lose that single point of access up to the, to the north, yeah. we still have to get around it somehow. Now, eventually, it, it, it may connect with other developments <coughs> that are planned out there in the future, but... It's going to be very long. This northwest, this northwest uh, lot right here is actually a retention bond. Is that correct? So that, yeah. as far as constructing a road across that? Yeah, it's... I, I don't know the feasibility of going along the yes, side that's, road. That's a, that's a detention pond, the detention. one in the northwest okay. corner. Yeah. Detention. Okay. These these parcels are selling right now to, I don't know <coughs> which of them may still be unsold and therefore available for use um, for emergency access. Um, that's another reason for the urgency of this right. Ryan, I believe, controls these two. Here, next to the detention pond in the corner. I think Ryan controls all of those. Mm -hmm. Well, if we have on there, there's only right. one point of access to your flat on the deeds. I think that might <laughs> reduce the number of houses being so quickly. Well, that, that, that could be one of the sort of a last, last solution. Uh, if, if there's <coughs> no other solution that's forthcoming, then we can, let me put it, I've discussed this with the recorder. He said, the recorder cannot place any statements on the deeds. We record the deeds. Where that happens is at the approval process that, that effectively says to the developer, if you want to build this, you're going to put this statement on the deed that reflects back to the record plan and so on and so forth. For example, the, uh, the recent uh, Zimfer development with the abrogation agreement, there will be a statement on the deed that refers to the abrogation language on the record plan. We can't put the easement on the deed itself, but we can refer to it so that, so that there's so that we rise to the legal standing of being able to say you knew or should have known had you read what you signed <coughs> and bought your house, you should have known. The problem with that is if so many of those lots are already sold, what are you going to do with those deeds? Right. They will. They have to put something, I guess you can. People need to know. I'm not sure they care. I'm not, you know, sure I'm not sure they, they, they don't care until, 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 one until it gets blocked yeah. off and yeah. you can't get in there. Because I've had this discussion with other people on LC if you would. I don't care. I don't want another access into that in LC. It's in the cities. There's emergency it's access the top of that. I said, what if you have a heart attack and there's a tree on the street there? Well, person I get that. But, uh, that's a, a major concern, and I don't think until it happens that they worry about it. Well, but it current, has been, and I would say what you said. I think we need to have a street along the bottom where that red line is. That should be part of the plat. Continue it, I guess, with your yellow line to access up into the other plat to provide it, and to discourage any further. Is Sherborne a, a private? Yes. It's country yeah. club, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Country club yeah. Isn't because your shortest path would come through here. But. Right. However, with the detention pond there, uh, I'm not sure there's room. I, no. Kim, what do you think? Is there room to put an emergency? Right here. Sorry. You can on come off side. to the left of that house. Oh, 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 that way. I'm saying on this side of the house. Yeah. Instead uh, of coming left. across from the cul-de-sac, come down here. It's the shortest right. path. Yeah. But it's 
a private road. Yeah, it's a private and road. And, and then you'd have to obviously deal with the, the property issues. That assumes well. the possibility of an agreement with Country Club of the North. Well, they have the same issue. I was going to say, it might be beneficial <coughs> to them. They have the same issue. Right, of course. Of course. And that, that's why it's a policy uh, discussion as well as what do we do for this immediate situation. I, I think maybe the best approach to take here is to make it clear to the developer and his designer, his engineer, on Thursday that we will be requiring a secondary access point to these plats and not tell him how to do it. I, th I think the role of government and inspectors ideally is to lay out the specs, but we're not in the business of dictating methods and materials. You come back to us with a proposal. You do the work, and we'll say yay or nay, but you do the work. We're going to require this access, period. And, and keep it simple and straightforward and firm and unyielding, and, and the county approval process goes nowhere unless we do have those, that consideration. Um, no emergency access, whatever, is represented on the, on the record plan that was submitted for 3B, which is the green space um, oh, to the north yeah. is there. Yeah. Not even the existing access. That's, that's the that's the section that we'll be considering on Thursday for the first time. So um, I, I I don't know. That's just one idea that we can we can work with them <coughs> informally with some of his suggestions. But I think as a as an official statement of what we want, uh, I think we should simply stop and say. We, we are going to require this. You tell us how you're going to do it. And we're going to also require the, the standards that have been approved. Sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, that, um, There's actually that color one is not approved. That's one that will be coming back at some point for addition. So that is new language that the UFC has created since the township is that what adopted it. Um, I believe so. I think that was Randy's recommendation. Um, he wasn't able to be here today because he drew on the lottery this morning. So, um, for uh, our drug free workplace policy, um, the uh, but my, his recommendation is yes. At some point, we need to adopt that. The one in your right hand is the Ohio Fire Code, and that's that is actively in place right now. So we can use any of that. There are standards, yeah, in that one. Do we have that in our policy, that they have to follow those? This, the approved standards in the Ohio by, uh, Administrative Code and everything. Well, well it's not an additional policy. It is just a guidance, and it's already law. So it, it allows <coughs> us at the, their I think stage. We refer to it saying, these are what we... Right. Will yeah. require. Yeah, I don't think yeah. we, there's an additional policy. What we refer in, and quite frankly, through the zoning process, when it goes to the zoning commission, we we look at things like that and and refer if there's any questions back to the code. In the subdivision process, we confer with the township and they tell us what kind of specifications they want in the construction drawings. Yeah. And the record, are we in the green? In the record. It would be my. <laughs> proposal that we have the policy stating that we do need two accesses to every plot as required by the, suggested by the fire department for emergency access and the standards as set forth on the state level, however you want to discuss that is terminology. Is that sufficient or do we need to also put a caveat in there that from phase one or from phase two on. 
Because if you just how early in there, the development it occurs, what, what Ms. Grant just described, I could come back and I could put it in in my fifth phase, but up until up until. No, I'm saying that if this will be our policy from here here on. So from so I'm trying to think get we it want it before phase. phase. That's what I'm saying. So from onset, yeah. it's from phase one forward. Yes, sir. Right. That's what I'm just trying to make sure. We're on okay. Show that Is there anything else you'd like to? Add to that, so we can. No, have and then leave, like Mr. Hamlin said, yeah. leave this, leave, leave the design and the construction of it to the developer to yeah. ensure that these take place. But yeah. you have to have a, you have to have a, a stopgap to prevent. Well, and then number two, I don't know how we prevent the DPNL issue um, you know, coming on top of the road. Requires separate easements. Oh, well, yeah, separate you easements. Have a road easement. How do we address that? So that that's doesn't happen again. You're talking about the new part of the old. No, I'm saying from we, we put it. Yeah, we're alert to making sure the language specifies who supersedes who. Uh, Do you know what I'm saying? Because we we yeah. we put this in place. We and he puts a road in through here, and then DPNL comes back five years later and puts another. Yeah. How do we prevent that? Because we're going into a into a utility easement. I think you do that with what's currently in place, or kind of like what I do now, is you're out there every day, and if you know that access is supposed to be there, and you see something happening, you you start making phone calls, which is kind of what we do now. Is there any demarcation of these things? Are they, are they, I know they just they tend to, the grass creeps, because the residents... Some of them are more evident than others. I think that's the second discussion we're going to have. If you look throughout the city, um, Township. So we have 38 to 40 of these that we know of, and we have everything from completely obstructed, unmarked, you wouldn't know it was there unless you knew it was there, to actually a few that are fairly well maintained, identified, secured, and, and so we've got the gambit. Which again, that's one of my bigger concerns is we can solve this problem probably pretty easily, but that doesn't help me with all of the ones that I have to clean up and maintain longer term. And obviously, I'll be working with another governmental body uh, to accomplish the, the vast majority of those. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, there's only a small handful in the township now. Maybe like there's only two. One, seven, two know, yeah. Six or seven in the township. Yeah, uh, that's only two. Yeah, only two in here. On this map, <laughs> there's a couple As I said, there's been the others that have been approved. I know. Oh, okay. But they haven't made it on the map. Okay, well, they haven't been developed. Yeah. So, are we going to have standards for? for how they are to, to be maintained. Yeah, the Ohio Fire Code covers really all of that, and if we adopt Unified, we'll get a little bit of additional clarification in language. So the, the how, we may, how it should be maintained, how it should be marked, um, turning radiuses, grade, all of that is addressed. Uh, gates, barricades, signage, all that's all addressed. Um, and we have a fairly clear path based off of uh, um, legal's uh, opinion on, on how it has been adopted for maintaining it. So there is a, we have the ability, for example, to cite, and it's a minor misdemeanor, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah. Um, the way it's, it's written now. So we can go about that fairly easily, again, in the township. We can go into the incorporated township, the city, um, and do some of that. But again, the, because the Ohio Fire Code covers city and township. It's been adopted in the city and the township, the Unified has. So we have equal authority, but with a different, again, governmental body, we may not have the same level of support um, or clear vision as to how to address the issue. So that's probably the bigger problem. Is, that is there anything is. that you as a department responded and say if these accesses do not come up to those standards, they will not be rec you know, used or recognized as such. I, actually, I think that's probably the wisest direction we're going to have to go is identify, and we're, we're in the process of doing an inventory not only of the locations, but of the condition, the accessibility, the markings, and all that to see what what's usable, what's not. Um, there's a few that are probably completely un unfeasible at this point to try and even reclaim without major property owner issues and things like that. So I think that is probably what we're going to have to do is say, okay, unless everybody agrees to bring X to standard, we're going to write this off and, and say that we're not going to rely on it or we're not even going to acknowledge its existence. 
but then we want hold harmless. And that's a legal thing to and have notify to do. Right. those individuals who mm -hmm. are affected by those areas, including you know, I'll work with the cities to say mm -hmm. that this is what's going to take place because they don't want their people not being protected either. Right. Well, and so. you know, a classic, probably the best example of this is um, at the end of Mill Run, uh, which is the first road south of Pebble Creek. There's mm -hmm. a cul de sac yeah. on the east side. Um, and then Fairfield, there's a, a small connector between them that now has a fence, a hill, and trees across it. Um, so it is completely inaccessible right now. So unless the property owners agree to change the landscaping, move the fence, and everything else, there is absolutely no way we could use it. That, that one property owner has affected the emergency access, probably doesn't even know it's there, quite frankly. I, I don't think they did it intentionally but it affects everybody on that dead end section of Mill Run. So at what point do, do we address all of those people, let them all know that, hey, this is an issue, or do we just say, we're not gonna use it, we're not gonna recognize it, we're gonna, again, pretend it doesn't exist. Matter of fact, the, <laughs> interestingly enough, they're doing all the curb work, or the, the curb and gutter work up there. I was curious to see if that's one of the sections they're gonna go in, because there's depressed curb, and if they're gonna put in a standard three inch, you know, Standard curve is in place of the the uh, depressed the roll, the roll yeah. Um, so that's that's probably our worst case scenario in all of this as far as it exists. My suggestion would be that if any of those are declared unusable, then we have notices to hand out to the residents who were affected, saying there is. <laughs> This has been abandoned, if you would, as an emergency access. Are those old ones, were there easements back then? I have no idea. We have not gotten If those easements yes. are recorded, then they're in a position where they ought to know. Right. And, and so whether they do know or yeah. not. Or whether they may. The previous owner may have built the fence. The previous <coughs> owner may have built the mound. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's a, if it's a recorded easement, then it, unfortunately, 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 they're in a position where they ought to know. And we're, and we're to the point now. Yeah. yeah. We're to the point now where, depending on the guidance we got from the board today, we're going to go in and do a lot of additional work to try and determine those, because that's going to be a lot of digging through old records, finding the plans, finding what's recorded, and this don't mention to whom. You have to figure out what's underneath it. Mm -hmm. I know the one on Garden View, and it's grass over it. Supposedly mm -hmm. there's a road underneath it, Correct. if you remember this case. Yeah. Uh, can you go in with a, some sort of a tester as you go with the graves? to see what's, if there's anything underneath there. And yeah. how deep the grass might be. You can go in and do, you know, soil sample. Yeah, of course. To see if actually that's viable to get into either Marini, which is a very, 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 very long culture snack. And I don't think those people, I don't think they didn't care. They didn't want it open. You just want to know the pros. You're not going to do compaction tests and things like that. No, because if it was put in, it's there. It should have been put in and probably at the time, hopefully inspected by whatever government agency, um, whether that city township. I believe it was a street, and then they didn't want it to the street, so then they covered it up with grass. Yeah, so it should have been built to the standards as required at the time. Um, so, and if it was for emergency access, it should be able to hold a fire truck. Now, a ladder truck, I don't know, but fire truck, it should be able to hold. Oh, stop. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, it sounds like you have, you have a consensus, at least from the board, so what action do you need from us on this today? Are you going to draft some language? Do you need a motion? Yeah, we'll just have to draft some language, I think. Yeah. And so, do you need that before your meeting? Or do you need that today? Well, I think you know what the sense is, at least for the meeting on Thursday. One, two actions. Yeah, one, I feel prepared. I, th I think um, in preparation for Thursday's meeting, the comments that regional planning gets from each of us who who sends comments should all say the same thing about it. whatever else we comment on from our own individual perspectives. We all we should all comment on this one and say. Yeah. And in this specific case, uh, we have, uh, what would the developer push back on, obviously, the cost of doing this? So the answer is you can either make the one that has the DPNL obstruction on it work, or you can fix the, the encroachment on the easement 
Actually, or you can create the third. The DPNLE zone one was vacated to make the, the, the other one. To make the second so one. So that right. first one that was okay. put in is, it was vacated. And okay. okay. But no longer exists. So now the house is. The, the only one that's in now is either either fix the house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Either have to fix the house or create or build a second road, yeah. Yeah. whichever is less expensive. So that will be the pushback. So now, the, because they, they already agreed to the emergency access, and now it's just you've made it unusable. Un un mm -hmm. Well, let me say this too in regards to the uh, unified fire code that's been adopted by both communities. There is an appeals process as well, um, and the township has, um, although not active, has a um, fire code board of appeals. Um, had cases in the past. Uh, the last one, going back a ways, when Chief Unix was here, um, where a developer came in and asked for a variance from the code, uh, much like you would in, with the BTA process, um, or zoning appeals process, you'd go in and ask for a variance for that. Now, it was denied in that case because uh, it had some public safety and it in that case was, um, as I recall, Dave, you might want to help me out on this, I think that was a uh, Gallons per minute to the hydrants in a dead end. Um, it's that far back. Yeah. So of course, so there is an appeals process. There's also an appeals process through the Ohio Fire Code as well, but that would be conducted at. Uh, but those are free, those are free construction appeals processes. Right. Those not are free, not, not like after this. Easy. This is more of an enforcement. In the, in that case, it's also incumbent on us then to make sure that that the applicants are aware of that appeals process in writing at the time of the decision. So, and as far as notification to the residents, um, there's a bit of CYA on that, but then there's also, um, how does that impact their homeowner's insurance? Does it change It likely does not affect anything for insurance. Okay. Um, it's really more of a, a tactical issue if we were to have an incident. So, so, there's a, so there's an awareness. It's just literally an awareness. We need to make them aware of, the, of what they're living in, whether they knew it or not when they bought there. Yeah. And actually, that for full disclosure, that's my neighborhood, um, mm -hmm. and I bought there knowing what it was and wasn't there. So it's. Um, uh, but we're about to have a, our first homeowners association meeting, and this is one of the topics that is going to come up. It's already been asked to me. In is that turned over to a resident board yet? Not yet, um, but it, that transition is looming, and uh, with all the new construction going on, there's been some concerns about how some of the new construction is being handled and, and some of the rules that are supposed to be in place. Dave, do you know whether sections 3A and 3B will be folded into the, the existing homeowners association I or establish their own? No idea. Be wise rather than have a multiplicity. <laughs> Oops. Well, he's going to jump across the river. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's all part of River West. Yeah, this is yeah. all Scarborough. I'm not sure the, the West Side will have much to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Probably just the, the all decks will be all one Okay. Yeah, the original uh, site plan approval or PUD approval was on both sides of the road. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think we have a consensus then from us. So. Anything else? Thank you, board. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. We appreciate it, Bill. Yes, most of the time. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good Yes. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Oh, we'll be working for next week.